Let's think about the effect that taxes have on a market. Let's start by thinking about a tax on buyers. And let me just kind of uh, quickly review the, the theory on taxes. I know I've said this a lot, but if you want to brush up on taxes, then I would go back to my YouTube video for my principles of micro class and just watch the video on, on taxes just to kind of get up to speed if, if you're, it's been a while since you've looked at that. So if we think about a tax on buyers, a tax on buyers decreases the buyer's willingness to pay for the good by the amount of the tax. So if we think about the demand curve that consumers have, the demand curve represents willingness to pay. Here's a demand curve. It represents the value that consumers place on the good. A tax on buyers reduces the value that they place on the good because now, in, usually the example that I use in class is, suppose that you're willing to pay $10 for a pizza. And you call up the pizza place and, and they say, if they say any price below 10, you buy the pizza. 10 is the maximum you're willing to pay. So if they say, hey, the pizza is $7, then you buy it and you get $3 of consumer surplus. So $10 is the maximum price you're willing to pay. Now let's suppose that the government imposes a $1 tax on you on the pizza. So every time you buy a pizza, you have to, in addition to paying the price for the pizza, you have to send a dollar to the government. Well, now the most you'll be, you'll be willing to pay the pizza place is $9 because on top of that $9 that you pay to them, you've got to send a dollar to the government. And so the tax plus what you pay the pizza place has to add up and be less than or equal to your total willingness to pay of $10. So what it does is it shifts your willingness to pay down by the amount of the tax T. This would be your demand curve when we think about how the tax affects your incentives. So I'm going to call that the demand curve. You might not be able to read that, but it says with tax. A tax on buyers reduces willingness to pay by the amount of the tax. A tax on sellers increases their cost of production by the amount of the tax. So if we're thinking about a price quantity picture where we've got a supply curve, remember that that supply curve represents cost of production. So let's suppose you're a pizza restaurant and it, it costs you $5 to make a pizza. So to pay for the raw materials and the electricity and the labor and all of that, it costs you $5 to make a pizza. Well, you're not going to sell the pizza for $4 or $3. You're going to be willing to sell it for anything $5 and above. You'd love to sell it for $20. If it costs you $5 and you sell it for $20, you get $15 of producer surplus. But now suppose the government places a tax on you. Every time you sell a pizza, you have to send a dollar to the government. Well, all that does is add a cost of production to you. Now it costs you $6 per pizza to sell, to produce it. And so it shifts your cost curve straight up. There's our supply curve with the tax. It is T dollars higher than it used to be. So if the tax is placed on buyers, it shifts the demand curve down by T dollars. If the tax is placed on sellers, it shifts the supply curve up by T dollars. So now if we want to think about the impact that a tax has, let's do a tax here on buyers first. So we've got our demand curve, supply curve. Let's start right here at point A. Our initial price is P1 and our initial quantity is Q1. And now let's suppose we have a tax that's imposed on buyers. That tax is going to shift the demand curve down by T dollars. So here's our demand curve with the tax and it is T dollars below that original demand curve. So now we look at the intersection 
between our new demand curve and the supply curve and the intersection is right there, we can see that that tax on buyers is going to reduce the quantity that's transacted in the market. Any tax reduces the amount of economic activity. The amount that the buyer is going to pay to the seller falls. This price right down here, I'm going to call it PS. That's the seller's price. Remember here, the tax is on the buyers. So from the seller's perspective, they don't have to send any dollars to the government. So whatever they are paid by the buyer, they get to put that in their pocket and they keep it. But that's not the end of the story for the buyer. The buyer, on top of what they pay to the seller, they have to pay the tax. And so this distance right here between this point and right there, that distance by definition is the amount of the tax. So right up here ends up being what I'm going to call PB. That's the buyer's price, the full price the buyer pays. So what we can see is that the tax drives a wedge between the price the buyer pays and the price the seller pays and the size of the wedge is the amount of the tax T. The other interesting thing that we see is that even though this is a tax on buyers, it ends up, of course, driving the buyer's price up, but it also drives the seller's price down. And so this distance right here we call the buyer's incidence of the tax. And this distance right here we call the seller's incidence of the tax. The incidence is how much it drives your price up if you're a buyer, how much it drives your price down if you're a seller. So part of the tax burden falls on the buyers and part falls on the sellers. And you know already that the relative size, here it looks like it's split kind of down the middle, but it's determined by the elasticity of the demand curve compared to the elasticity of the supply curve. So there's our tax on buyers. Let's quickly do a tax on sellers. So got our demand curve, supply curve, right here, Q1. So now instead of placing the tax on the buyers, let's place the tax on the sellers. Here's our initial price without any tax. Now the tax on sellers drives the cost of production for the sellers up by T dollars. So the supply curve is going to shift straight up by T dollars. There's the supply curve with the tax. Our initial equilibrium with no tax was right there at point A. With the tax, our equilibrium comes up here to point B. And we see that the quantity falls to Q2 a tax, whether it's placed on buyers or whether it's placed on sellers, is going to reduce the quantity that's transacted in the market. The price that the buyer pays to the seller is right up here. I'm going to call it PB. Now, from the buyer's perspective, that's the end of the story because this is a tax on sellers. So whatever the buyer pays to the seller, the buyer walks away, they're done. They don't have to send any more dollars to the government. But notice that the seller doesn't get to keep all of those dollars. The seller has to send T dollars per unit away to the government. And so if we take away T dollars from what they're paid, remember this vertical distance is the amount of the tax T, that takes us right back down to this point. That is the number of dollars that the seller gets to keep. The difference between the buyer's price and the seller's price is the amount of the tax T. The incidence of this tax that falls on the buyers is right here. And the incidence that falls on the sellers is right there. And you can see, hopefully you remember from your principles class, that a tax on buyers is exactly equal to a tax on sellers. It doesn't matter which side of the market you tax. The buyer's price ends up being the same in both of these pictures. The seller's price ends up being the same in both of these pictures. If the amount of the tax was the same, the quantity falls by the same amount, the incidence that falls on the buyers is going to be the same, and the incidence that falls on the sellers is going to be the same. It doesn't mean that the incidence is going to be split equally between the, two bu between the buyers and the sellers. It just means that Regardless of whether the tax is passed on buyers or passed on the sellers, the outcome will be exactly the same. 
And, and I always encourage my students to think about the implication of that. What that means is that anytime you hear a politician talk about either raising or lowering taxes on one side of the market versus the other, you shouldn't be fooled by that. That's just a smokescreen. That's a way of getting people to vote for you by taking advantage of their ignorance of how taxes actually work. I would also argue that there are plenty of politicians that don't know how taxes actually work and do think that it matters which side of the market you tax or cut taxes for, but it doesn't. Okay? You either tax the market or you don't tax the market. The outcome is going to be the same regardless of which side you tax. What that means is there's actually a, a third way to illustrate the effect of a tax, at least graphically. If we're thinking about the demand curve and the supply curve, Let's identify our initial price, P1, our initial quantity, Q1. So what we can do here is we can look at these pictures and we can see that what really matters is if we think about the original demand curve and the original supply curve, what matters is the distance vertically between the original demand curve and the original supply curve ends up being the amount of the tax T. Right there, that distance. Same thing with this distance. That ends up being the amount of the tax T in both pictures. So all we have to do to illustrate a tax is we find the place where the vertical distance between the demand curve and the supply curve is the amount of the tax T. Once you've found that point, that gives you the quantity. There's Q2. The higher price, of course, will be the buyer's price. Call it PB. And the lower price will be the seller's price, PS. And here you can see that this picture, in terms of the prices and the quantity, is exactly the same as these two pictures. We didn't have to go through the process of shifting a curve because it doesn't matter which curve you shift. Now, what's, this is how to analyze a tax graphically. What we're going to be doing in this class is we're going to think about how to analyze a tax mathematically. So what we have to do is think carefully about, you know, how do you actually do the math of this? And it's very simple. Hopefully you can see that all you need to do to figure out the functional form for this demand curve with the tax is simply change the intercept of the original demand curve. Or if you wanted to do it here, all you have to do is change the intercept of the supply curve. Now, we have to be careful about which intercept. This is actually the intercept of the inverse demand curve, and this is the intercept of the inverse supply curve. But the mathematics of how to actually solve a problem are very straightforward, and we'll go through that here in a second. Um, actually, let's do that now. Let me clear this off and then we'll do a quick uh, tax. Let's do a quick problem here just to illustrate how easy taxes are. For, for some reason, students sometimes find taxes challenging. Um, but once you see the math of it, as long as you pay attention and you work through some problems before you get into a homework or a test, it should be pretty straightforward. So let's look at an inverse demand curve. Um, that looks like this, 11 minus Q over 2. There's a nice, simple inverse demand curve. Let's suppose we have an inverse supply curve that looks like this, P equals 2 plus Q. Also nice and simple. And let's suppose that um, we want to analyze the impact of a tax. Now, the first thing we need to do is figure out what the price and quantity would be without the tax. So we need to figure out what would happen if the market was just allowed to operate. So we're going to set our inverse demand and inverse supply curves equal to each other. One thing that you could do is you could invert these and then set those equal to each other, but there's no reason to. In fact, this is going to be nice because since we're starting with the inverse demand and inverse supply curves, we can simply graph those and then we'll have the picture that we're used to using. So I'm just going to set these equal to each other. 11 minus Q over 2 is equal to 2 plus Q. Um, I'm going to move the 2 over so I get 9 is equal to Q over 2 plus 
this is going to need a common denominator, so I'm going to go ahead and make it 2q over 2. 9 equals 3q over 2. 18 equals 3q. q equals 6. So the equilibrium quantity in this market is going to be 6. We can figure out the price by just plugging that quantity back into either of these. It's easiest to plug it into our inverse supply curve. This tells us that our equilibrium price is going to be 2 plus 6. It's going to be equal to 8. So there's our equilibrium price and quantity. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a picture that goes with that. I've probably said this several times, it's very useful to draw the picture that goes with the problem that you're working with, but make sure before you start drawing it that you're drawing the inverse demand and inverse supply curve. So let's put it right down here. So we've got a choke price here of 11, and there's our demand curve. Our supply choke price is 2. And here's our supply curve. I'm not worried too much about accurately representing the slopes of those things. With this one, it's a little easier because the slope of the supply curve is twice the slope of the demand curve. But again, I'm not too worried about that. My picture is only going to be to organize the information. I'm not ever going to use it to solve for any of the numbers. I solve for the numbers right here. So our quantity ends up being 6, and our price ends up being 8. There's the situation we've got before we impose any tax. Okay? So now, let's consider a tax of $3. Consider a tax of $3. We can impose that tax on the buyers. We can impose that tax on the sellers. It doesn't matter. Let's think about what would happen if we did either of those. You don't want to do both. If you impose a $3 tax on the buyers and a $3 tax on the sellers at the same time, that's a $6 tax. So you want to do either the buyers or the sellers. But I'm going to show you what it would look like in each case. So let's think about a tax on buyers first. Tax on buyers. So remember that what this is going to do is it's going to shift the inverse demand curve down by three dollars. So the new inverse demand curve, its intercept instead of being 11 is going to be eight. It's going to come right down through here. Okay, so our new inverse demand, new inverse demand would end up being P equals 3 minus q over 2. It doesn't change the slope. It simply shifts the intercept down. Don't worry that it, it now makes, that's going to be 8, not 3. It reduces it by 3. So now the intercept of this demand curve, this new inverse demand curve, is equal to what the price originally was, but that doesn't, that doesn't matter. Don't think that somehow you've made a mistake that's just the way it, it worked out. So let's think about why this makes sense. What happens here is that if you want to understand why the intercept shifts down, what's happening is that buyers are paying $3 more per unit. This is a tax on buyers. So their price is $3 more. Instead of just being P, it's P plus 3. So if we replace P, with p plus 3 in this function, then here's what it would look like. p plus 3 instead of p is equal to 11 minus q over 2. We replace the p with p plus 3. Now you subtract the 3 from this side, move it to the other side, you just get that. So this is the intuition for why that works. And I'll show you this here in just a second if we wanted to do this with the demand curve instead of the inverse demand curve. Okay. But here's what matters. There's your new inverse demand curve. Let's think about what the inverse supply curve would look like if we imposed this tax on sellers. So let's suppose we did it on tax on sellers. Our new inverse supply curve is going to look like this. Remember, 
we take the original supply curve and it's going to shift up by $3. So our intercept, instead of being two, is gonna shift up here to by $3 to be five. So our new inverse supply curve is going to be five plus Q. Now let's think about the intuition of why that matters. A tax on sellers takes $3 away from the sellers. So we could look at replacing the price with P minus three. Instead of getting to keep P, they get to keep P minus $3 because they have to send those $3 to the government. So I replace the P with P minus three and then that's still equal to two plus Q. You move the three over, you get P equals five plus Q. So this is the intuition for why you're changing the intercept of these things. So right there's what my inverse supply curve would be if this was a tax on sellers. Now, notice that this would work, also works, if we use the demand or supply curve instead of the inverse demand or inverse supply curve. Here's why this works. If you look at the demand curve, if you invert that, here's what the demand curve looks like. It would be Q equals 22 minus 2P. There's the demand curve that goes with that inverse demand curve. If we replaced the P with P plus 3, it would look like this, 22 minus 2 times P plus 3. What we've done is we've just imposed a $3 tax on the buyers. If you distribute that 2 through, you get this, Q equals 22 minus 2P minus 6. And the 22 minus 6 looks like this, Q equals 16 minus 2P. This is the exact same function as that. They are inverses of each other. So it doesn't matter if you plug in the P plus 3 right here, or if you plug in the P plus 3 right here, or if you just simply remember, I have to reduce the intercept of my inverse demand curve by $3. All of those are equivalent. If we look at the inverse supply curve, here's what it looks like. Q equals negative 2 plus P. This is the inverse of that function right there. Well, if instead of P, we plug in P minus 3 because the sellers get to keep $3 less, so Q with the tax, it would look like this. Minus 2 plus P minus 3. So now we get Q equals minus five plus P. This is the inverse of that. So what you can do is you can go this route simply by changing the intercept, or you can plug in, in the case of a $3 tax on buyers, where you see a P, plug in P plus three, or if you have a $3 tax on sellers, Every place you see P, plug in P minus three, because they're losing $3, okay? So those are, those are the ways of appropriately adjusting either the demand curve or the supply curve. Now keep in mind that a tax on buyers is equivalent to a tax on sellers. So changing the intercept of the demand curve is going to give you the same answer once you set this demand curve equal to the original supply curve as you'll get if you change the intercept of the supply curve and set it equal to the original demand curve. You just need to pick one or the other, whichever you're most comfortable with. So let's use a tax on buyers. Let's place the tax on buyers. So our Inverse demand curve is going to look like this. P equals um, 8 minus Q over 2. And we want to set that equal to, what we're doing is we're shifting the demand curve down by $3. Here's the demand curve with the tax. 
We've shifted it down by $3. What we're looking for now is this intersection. So we want to set that new demand curve, 8 minus Q over 2, we want to set that equal to the original supply curve, 2 plus Q, the original inverse supply curve. So when we do this, we get 6 is equal to Q over 2 plus 2Q over 2. 6 is equal to 3Q over 2. 12 equals 3Q. Q equals 4. So the tax is going to reduce quantity transacted in this market to 4 units. Now we need the buyer's price and we need the seller's price. So what we're going to do is we can plug this quantity of 4 back in to either the shifted demand curve or the original supply curve, inverse demand, inverse supply, to get this price, which is going to end up being the seller's price. So let's do that. Let's plug in a quantity of 4 um, into the original supply curve, inverse supply. So to get the, the seller's price, we get um, P equals 2 plus whatever our quantity is, which is 4. P is equal to $6. There's the seller's price. We can easily get the buyer's price because we know that it's going to be $3 higher. But let's figure that out. We can plug in that quantity of 4 into the original inverse demand curve, which would be right there. P equals 11 minus Q, which is 4, over 2. So P is equal to 11 minus 2. P is equal to 9. There's the buyer's price. And you can see that the distance between the buyer's price and the seller's price is the amount of the tax, $3. The incidence of the tax that falls on the buyers is $1, and the incidence of the tax that falls on the sellers is $2. Two-thirds of the tax falls on the sellers, one-third of the tax falls on the buyers. So you can see that the, the incidence of the tax is not split equally. So you can see that analyzing the effect of a tax is not hard. You just need to change either the inverse demand curve or the inverse supply curve, or if you want to work with the demand and supply curves, you can adjust those appropriately. But it's still just a matter of setting demand curves and supply curves equal to each other, solving for quantities, plugging those quantities back in to get some prices. That's how it works. Um, what we'll do now is we'll clear this off and then we'll finish up by just kind of looking at um, the impact of a tax on consumer and producer surplus. Let's take a look quickly at the effect of a tax on consumer and producer surplus. So let's use that third way of analyzing a tax where we don't shift a curve. So we've got an inverse demand inverse supply, let's call this P1 and we'll call that Q1 with no tax then our price is going to be P1, our quantity is going to be Q1. If there's no tax there's only one price in the market. Anytime you have a tax that tax drives a wedge between the buyer's price and the seller's price. And so if we have a tax, let's make it a decent size tax so everything's easy to see. Let's suppose we have a big tax. This vertical distance there will be the amount of the tax. It's going to drive the buyer's price up here. We'll call that PB. The seller's price is going to be right down here, PS. Our quantity, let's just call it Q2, our quantity is going to fall to there. And then let's give these... Uh, areas, some names, let's call this A, B, C, D, E, and F. Let's do the same thing we always do. Let's say with no tax, 
our consumer surplus with no tax is all of the area under the demand curve and above the price. So it's going to be A plus B plus C. Producer surplus would be the area under the price and above the supply curve, which is D plus E plus F. There's no dead weight loss if we don't have a tax. Okay. And our, of course, our quantity would be Q1. <clears throat> with the tax, let's start with consumer surplus. Our consumer surplus with the tax, the price is going to go from P1 up to PB. So our consumer surplus is going to fall to just area A. Consumers, once the tax is imposed, consumers lose B plus C. That's dollars out of their pocket. Producer surplus is the area under the seller's price and above the supply curve. Producer surplus falls to just F. Producers lose D and E. So you can see that a tax is going to hurt buyers and hurt sellers in terms of, of the, the measures of well-being that we're using here. It's less dollars in their pocket. It also creates deadweight loss because it pushes us away from the, the efficient quantity of Q1. The tax causes quantity to fall to Q2, so our deadweight loss is going to be C plus E. And remember that that means that the economic pie is shrinking. There's less economic well-being to go around. But B and D don't vanish. Those actually are part of what is government revenue. So there's some revenue that the government collects from this tax. So government revenue. You can think about calculating the government revenue a couple of different ways that actually turn out to be equivalent to each other. Q2 units are going to be bought and sold, so the tax revenue is going to be the number of units, which is Q2, times the tax, which is T. So once you work through the problem, you're going to know what this quantity is, and you're obviously going to know what the tax is. And so you could easily calculate the amount of money that the government is going to bring in by multiplying the quantity times the tax. You can also think about it in terms of this area right here. B area B plus D, if you were to calculate the area of that rectangle, you wouldn't divide it into two rectangles. You just calculate the area of the big rectangle B and D. But notice what that is. This vertical distance here is the amount of the tax T, and this horizontal distance here is the quantity Q2. So when you calculate the area of this rectangle right here, you are taking T, multiplying it by Q2. So you can think about it in terms of an area or just two numbers multiplied by each other. You'll get the same answer. So you can see that. A tax burden falls on both buyers and sellers, regardless of which side of the market the tax is actually placed on. The government is powerless to determine anything about the, the incidence of the tax. It, it, they can't choose how the incidence falls. They can choose who they mechanically collect the tax from, but that's just a, a formality. That doesn't really matter. It sure matters in terms of the politics, though. So if you want to get votes and you know how to phrase the tax the right way, you can influence people who don't understand how taxes work. But from an economics perspective, that's just a smokescreen. Does this mean that because a tax creates dead weight loss, we shouldn't have taxes? And the answer is, of course, no. We need a government. Government serves very important functions in terms of protecting property rights and, and protecting the rights of, of people and um, making sure that, that markets function and that information gets um, dispensed to people who need it so that people can make good decisions. The government needs money to run. And so you shouldn't look at this and say, oh, well, look at that. Taxes, Taxes cause consumer and producer surplus to fall, so we shouldn't have taxes. That would be a little bit naive. Actually, it would be a lot naive. 
Um, but we have to be cognizant of the fact that taxes impose or create deadweight loss. And so we want to be smart about how we tax and we want to be smart about what we tax. One of the challenges is that politicians often forget that a tax discourages that activity. If you tax something, you discourage it. As an economist, I would argue that smart tax policy means that we would tax the things we want to see less of. So I would be in favor of taxing things that we want to see less of. If we want to see people smoke less, I would be fully in favor of taxing cigarettes more. Or if we wanted to see people drive less, buy less gas, tax gas. But instead what we do is we tax things we like. We tax work. The biggest tax in the U.S. economy is a tax on, on productive activity. And, and that results in less productive activity. So we, because of the way history has transpired, we've come up with a situation where we tend to tax good things. It's kind of like, um, you know, if I were, if I got to choose taxes, one of the things I would tax is getting a D or an F in a class. I'd love to tax that because I'd like to see less D's and F's. So let's suppose you take the class. If you get a D, you have to pay 500 extra dollars. Or if you get an F, you have to pay a thousand extra dollars. That would give people a strong incentive not to get a D or an F. Probably give people a strong incentive not to take my class if I was the only one doing it, but let's ignore that. Instead, it'd be like what we do is like taxing the people who are getting A's. So if you get an A, you've got to pay me $1,000. And you get a B, you have to pay me $500. Why would we ever do something like that? that that's obviously a bad policy. So we can't have no taxes, but I would argue that at least with new taxes, we should think carefully about what to tax and how much to tax it. Let's finish up by just talking about the incidence of the tax. Let me draw two pictures here so that we can see the effect that the elasticity has on tax incidence. So in my left picture, I'm going to draw a relatively inelastic demand curve, inverse demand curve, and a relatively elastic supply curve. And I'm going to identify my initial price, P1, my initial quantity, Q1. Over here, I want my, I want to use the same price and the same quantity. So I'm going to go over about the same amount. There's P1 and Q1. Only in this picture, I'm going to have a relatively inelastic supply curve and a relatively elastic demand curve. Two different pictures, same equilibrium price and quantity in both pictures, but I've changed the elasticity. Now, let's impose the same magnitude of tax in both of these situations. If we pose a tax here, We've got to find the place where the vertical distance is the amount of the tax. So let's suppose there's T. Well, my upper price is going to be the buyer's price. And my lower price right down here is going to be the seller's price. And you can see that in that particular situation, a majority of that tax burden is going to fall on the buyers. The sellers are not going to bear, bear very much of that tax burden. But let's place the same tax right over here. If we place the same tax, there's T, in this market, what we'll see is that it's going to drive the buyer's price up a little bit. Here's going to be PB, and then here's going to be PS. And you can see that the exact same magnitude of tax has a completely different impact in this market. It falls much more heavily on the sellers. Let's identify the quantity in both of these cases. There's Q2, here's Q2. So here the tax burden falls more heavily on the buyers. Here the tax burden falls more heavily on the sellers. And hopefully you remember that the, the general conclusion is that any tax burden is going to fall more heavily on the inelastic side of the market. Here it's the supply curve that's relatively inelastic. Over here, it's the demand curve that's relatively inelastic. And that should make intuitive sense because 
The inelastic side of the market is the side that doesn't adjust very much. And so, of course, the tax burden is going to, going to fall more heavily on the side that doesn't adjust very much. We can actually take a little shortcut to figure out the share of the tax that falls on each side. So let's say the, the share borne by the consumer, you can figure out how much of the share is going to fall on each side if you know the elasticity of demand and the elasticity of supply using this little formula. The share that falls on the consumers is going to be the elasticity of supply divided by the sum of the elasticity of supply and the absolute value of the elasticity of demand. The elasticity of demand is always a negative number and so we take the absolute value of it to get rid of the negative sign. So if you add up the elasticity of supply and the elasticity of demand and you put that in the denominator and then you put the elasticity of supply in the numerator, that'll tell you the share borne by consumers. The share borne by producers, you can probably guess, is this. It's the elasticity of demand, the absolute value divided by the elasticity of supply plus the elasticity of demand, absolute value. Now, let's be clear about what this is. This is not a way to calculate elasticity. We talked about how to calculate elasticity in a previous video. But if you know the elasticity of demand and the elasticity of supply, then you can figure out the share of a tax that's going to fall on the consumers and the share that's going to fall on the pr producers. The shares will add up to 100%. So this will end up being some percent, like 35% and 65%, something like that. It depends, of course, on the numbers that you've got. So hopefully that gives you an idea of how we can um, analyze price controls, how we can analyze taxes. We talked about um, the quota. Keep in mind here that I'm working through all of this graphically, but you should make sure that you practice how to work these problems out um, mathematically. And what we saw with the tax was that it's easy. With a price floor or a ceiling, it's also easy. You're going to be figuring out where uh, the demand curve and the supply curve intersect by setting them equal and then you're going to be plugging in whatever the price floor or price ceiling is. You're going to be plugging that into different curves to figure out what the quantities and different other prices are. And then once you've got the prices and the quantities, it's a matter of calculating different areas to get consumer and producer surplus. So I will see you in another video.